So it's, it's 401, so uh, let's get started. It's my pleasure to, uh, to be introducing Agostina Palmigiano. Uh, Agus is a uh, currently a Schwartz Foundation Fellow uh, for Theory in Neuroscience. She's at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia in New York. She's working with Ken Miller, uh, building theories of interneural uh, circuit models. Her PhD was in physics, uh, which uh, she obtained from the University of Buenos Aires uh, in uh, Argentina. Her work was, her uh, thesis work was on cultural connectivity in epilepsy. Yeah, that's my master's. I think. Oh, that was yeah. your master's. <laughs> oh, your master's, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> your PhD was in theoretical neuroscience at the Max Planck Institute, uh, where she worked with uh, Fred Wolf and uh, Theo Geisel on oscillations. Um, and uh, she has received several awards. I think the, one of the most notable one uh, is a uh, Simons Foundation that she was just uh, the uh, MTV uh, awarded um, uh, in anticipation of her getting her faculty position. Um, so she'll be telling us about dynamical signatures of non-sensory signals in sensory cortex. Please join me in welcoming uh, Agus. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so I wanted to start with this very, very broad question, uh, which is what are the circuit mechanisms that underlie flexible computation? So flexibility is uh, one of the most notable and spectacular features of our brain. So we are able to, for example, see objects, remember objects, link them to particular sensory motor, um, sorry, to particular actions, and we are also able to link them with reward. Um, and we are able to repurpose those associations whenever, whenever, for example, the context uh, changes. Um, and I wanted to like give you maybe a better example than the one that I am like doing uh, right here by just showing you this same water bottle. Uh, like for example, here you have a sensory stimulus. Uh, this sensory stimulus we can simplify it and think about an object that has very high contrast edges. Um, so these are supposed to be the edges of that object. And by just looking at this object, your visual cortex, for example, we have neurons that are specialized um, in detecting these high contrast bars. Um, and the activity in the sensory areas is something that we can call the sensory representation. Now, whenever we, we have an object, we usually have a sort of things that are associated to that object, in particular, if we have this water bottle, you can think that grasping and bringing that water bottle to your face uh, is a motor action that is associated to it, and you would most likely receive a type of reward, like, for example, water in this case. Um, but now, particular people uh, that work in different fields, they will have different associations. Uh, we can think about um, the field of making art with plastic bottle water, with water bottles. Uh, in which the motor association that these people have is, well, it's just grabbing a bottle, cutting it down, making a piece of art, and the reward that they are going to get, to get is not necessarily uh, water, but just um, it maybe recognition or money. Um, now, you can think that all these, all these um, representations that exist in the world or all these different um, tags uh, of a particular object are going to be integrated in an associative area. Um, and for example, if you have a, a certain object with a sensory representation and the motor link to that sensory changes, um, you can think that a higher order area that is making that association happen will have a representation that also changes. Um, and in a feedforward processing scheme, that would mean that your sensory representation can stay the same. Um, so in principle, you don't need to have changes in the sensory representation to have complex flexible computation. But the fact that cortex actually does have lateral connection between sensory processing areas and associative areas it tells us that from the connectivity alone, we can already expect that sensory areas are going to have um, changes in, in its activity patterns, depending on the context that the animal or ourselves uh, find, in, find ourselves in. Um, and so this leads us to think that sensory cortex in some animals can be thought as 
an associative area already. Um, and this, uh, this thought is actually backed up by some experiments that have shown in the last decade or so that if you go and record in the visual cortex of the mouse, you can actually very accurately decode the movement of the entire body and of the entire body. You can decode whether um, the animal is moving its paw, it's moving its body, it's moving its face, uh, things that are not necessarily associated or related in any way to the visual information that the animal is perceiving. Um, there is also ways of, of course, reward is also represented in the sensory cortex of this animal. Uh, and remarkably as well, um, people have put uh, marmosets walking on a treadmill and they have found that you can decode running speed again from the visual cortex of this animal. Um, and well, this is, this is kind of a remarkable fact. This, uh, this kind of challenges all the ways in which we have thought about sensory processing uh, and also the way that we think about, about computer vision, yeah, like a mostly a fit forward a fit forward problem in which we do certain tasks that are not necessarily related to the body movement um, of animals. So in my in my postdoc mostly, I worked in thinking about what are the links between more actions uh, in sensory processing. I thought about the role of locomotion, for example, which is a very strong signal. I am going to show you later today that you can, the activity of single cells is modulated by almost a twofold compared to how much these individual neurons are modulated by, by in visual stimuli. Um, and I also looked at artificial perturbations of activity, meaning just very controlled optogenetic um, changes uh, induced in cells by my experimental collaborators. Um, so in, in general, my research program involves defining a correct level, or I don't know if correct, but um, a satisfying level of granularity to study circuit dynamics and infer parameters from the data using certain methods that are available or that we have come up with. Um, doing some theoretical analysis of those models, it is important to me to have um, a framework to describe what is happening in the circuits uh, theoretically. And multiple times what happens is that one can ask what type of uh, what type of signatures that we observe through behavioral modulations of activity coming from behavioral signals or optogenetics you know what are what are the theoretical correlates uh, between these two things what 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 are the ingredients from our model that would lead to changes in activity like the ones that we observe in the data um, and lastly understand from this insight that one can have by, by this loop of the finance or good models that can reproduce the data and understand which mechanisms would uh, underlie certain changes in activity, understand whether those changes are similar or different across different species, whether they are common principles, um, for example, in, in, in the way that the activity occurs or how these circuits respond to perturbations. Um, sorry, and so today I am going to talk about two projects um, that have to some extent some of the ingredients that I show you here. No, uh, but people have to hear me. Yeah, I can rotate it a little bit more. Yeah, it's okay. Well, now you will see my notes. <laughs> it's fine. You, you will. You will all know. I have notes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So the first part, the question here, is how to infer large scale, large scale cell type specific models from neuronal data. Um, and as I said, this involves defining a level of granularity. You know, like how. Uh, how, how much detail we are going to incorporate in our model, uh, and also defining what are, is the summary statistic that we are interested in recovering from those models. Um, and in the second part, so in the first part, when I, when I do this type of inference, what I do is to look at data that comes from an animal in, an, in a stationary condition, such that um, then one can go and really ask, if we have a model of the animal when it's not moving, 
what does movement do uh, to a signal and therefore what is happening to a model? What, what do we need? Uh, what ingredients do we need to incorporate in our model such that we can capture those changes in activity induced by locomotion? Um, and in the third part, I am going to abstract a little bit of these kind of natural perturbations of activity, like for example, movement in the visual cortex. And I am going to look at responses to optogenetic perturbations in excitatory cells. And I am going to show you on the end of this that there are similarities in the way that the cortical circuit responds to these type of perturbations and the way that it responds to locomotion. Um, we have many different cell types in the brain. Um, in cortex, they are already quite a bit. Um, in particular, <laughs> for those who don't know, uh, there are two main types, um, pyramidal cells that I am going to call excitatory cells and then inhibitory cells uh, or interneurons. I am going to usually use this exchangeably. Um, these cell types, they are recurrently connected uh, among them and between them. And in particular, inhibition, um, has a lot of different subclasses. Um, there, are, um, there are at least five large classes of interneurons, uh, and I am going to work only with a fraction of them. Um, and I would like to highlight that, you know, like in the 100 million years of evolution that separate the mouse from us, what happened with the inter interneural network is that there was a twofold increase in the number of inhibitory cells, so meaning like, for example, if you think about the fraction of inhibitory cells that the mouse has, that's at around 15%, whereas in the human, it's around 13%. So that doubled. Uh, and also, there was an increase in the inhibitory to inhibitory connectivity. So there is, a lot of, um, there is a lot of variability. There is a lot of diversity in the interneuronal population. And the way that I would like to think about this is that these are the knobs um, that the brain can turn on and off. Um, to actually regulate pyramidal cell activity, do it in a flexible way. And this is the way that I think that many people by now believe it's a, it's a, it's a large contribution of what gives us flexibility, context-dependent computation, um, and just flexibility and adaptation in general. Um, so I worked with a data set that had, a, from these five large classes, only three of them, parvalum, BIP, and somatostatin. Um, and I am going to introduce them one by one. So parvalumin cells, they are bidirectionally connected to the pyramidal cell po population, and they are recurrently connected with, uh, between them. And one important way of thinking about these parvalumin cells is that they contribute to the stability of the circuit. So actually, if you go in the brain and you measure the activity of excitatory and parvalumin cells, they usually go hand in hand. Um, they increase and decrease their activity often um, at the same time. Um, if you, for example, inhibitorily suppress paralumin cells, you might have runaway activity. Uh, I invite you to think of what would happen if you want to have a strong recurrent excitation uh, in your network because you want to have the power of transmitting information. Uh, if you don't stabilize that circuit, it's going to lead to pathological behavior. So we believe that paralumin is doing uh, not only that, but also that job. Um, and then there are these two interneuronal types, somatostatin and VIP, that they are they inhibit each other and they engage in competitive dynamics. These competitive dynamics actually have been uh, shown to mediate contextual modulation and visual contextual modulation. For example, you present a stimulus, you change the background, the activity changes, and usually those activity changes are mediated by uh, different interneuronal types. And they have also been involved in um, the changes in activity induced by locomotion in the visual cortex. And that, that's why they are relevant uh, for me. Um, so the data, which is calcium imaging data, was collected by Dan Mosig in Hilela Desmix lab. Um, we have a mouse. It's running on a treadmill. Uh, it can run. It doesn't need to. And the visual stimuli that the animal is seeing are drifting gradings of different contrast values, like simple stimuli that we know how to parameterize uh, quite well. Um, but in this first part, I am going to be looking at data uh, when the animal is uh, stationary, when it's not moving at all. So these are the distributions of activity of each of the cell types that I introduced before as a function of the, of the stimulus contrast. Um, yeah, for, 
small. So we have small and big, but these ones are small, five, five, 10 degrees. Uh, so on the or close to the receptive field size. Yeah, and we did that. So in other work, we looked at the spatial components of this, uh, but not here. Here, I was interested more uh, in just having normal like vanilla RNNs, let's say. And for that, you don't want to have that uh, um, interaction. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Activity and those yeah, <laughs> good question. So um, the calcium imaging community, uh, in particular, this one, they do delta F over F, but they also normalize it by the average of the 10 the running average of the 10 percentile. So it's a weird, they normalize it in a particular way. That's why I put activity here. And that is, after that, this the, they extract fine rates. Okay, so the, this is rate, and this is how it relates to. So this is a distribution. So this is a like a probability density function, the histogram, and this is and this is kind of um, a deconvolved signal of something that is weirdly normalized. So that's why I put activity. So <laughs> sorry, it's um, yeah, and they have their reasons to do that. Um, so what does it mean that the PV shifts from left to middle? Like Intuitively, what does that mean is happening in contrast? So actually, yeah, if you would plot the mean activity as a function of contrast, so um, VIP activity goes up and down. Um, what does it mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's so it peaks at the at, at the prefer um, at like something like perception threshold, I would say something like 20%, you know, what is the perception threshold? Something like 12, 12% uh, 12 contrast. Okay. So that's more or less when the IP peaks and then it goes down uh, with increasing contrast. And so the way that I, like, it looks like there is some sort of competition at the beginning, somatostatin interneurons are very, very, very small. Uh, and when you increase contrast, somatostatin increases monotonically. And at the beginning VIP, they are both increasing, but then, uh, then you see the competitive dynamics at maximum contrast, but not in the middle. In the middle, it's like they are both kind of the largest. The, sorry, they are both kind of large. Um, yeah, and I, I also want to clarify, you know, like these distributions, they are not clearly bimodal, but they are also not clearly unimodal. And here you can see something like the potential, the potential fact that VIP actually has different type of subcell types. And here we are putting them together. Um, just something to clarify. Um, so to m make a model that can capture this data, we were interested in not only having a model that can capture the mean activity or the mean and the variance of the activity, but a way of, you know, having a model that whose parameters are, allow us to capture the entire distribution of activity for each cell type population as a function of the stimulus. Um, and the type of model that I looked at is this steady state and recurrent network model. So here you have fine rates. This is a large vector, a couple thousand neurons. But for what I'm going to show you now, it doesn't actually matter uh, because we have the scaling uh, of the parameters with a number of cells. And so these fine rates are just, you know, like um, the recurrent input that um, the recurrent inputs that is W times R plus the feed forward inputs that have visual information. Um, and so to build a model that captures this data, what you want to do is to infer the connectivity and the inputs. Um, and so in principle, there are many things that one can do. One of the things that one can do is to train a recurrent network model to, you know, like capture this activity. Um, but I did a trick which is that if this nonlinearity is a threshold power law, basically, and your connectivity uh, is such that it doesn't have like really heavy tail weights, this W times this R is gonna give you a sum of a lot of smaller things. In particular, it doesn't matter if they are small or not. The important thing is that this is not heavy tail. And therefore, the central limit theorem will apply. 
And therefore, all this is going to be Gaussian distributed. And when you push it through a nonlinearity, you can write explicitly what is going to be the distribution of fine rates at the outset and, and the outcome of this. Um, and so here you have a function that will be the target function. So this is what I want to get. I can fit this formula to the data. And OK, this is what I want to get. Um, and then the connectivity, this RNN is going to have something that looks like an, a stochastic dog model. Um, each block is going to have a mean that can be W alpha beta and a variance. That, so these alpha and beta are indexes that define the cell type, right? Um, what I'm thinking about here is there is a sparse connectivity and this connectivity distribution in each block has a mean and a variance. Um, doesn't matter if it comes from a Gaussian distribution or something that is just, there is a theorem that tells you that the first two moments actually define the, the eigenvalue distribution of this matrix. And so because we have this, um, and one can do the same thing with, the, with these inputs, which I do request them to be Gaussian distributed, um, one can directly relate uh, these connectivity parameters from the connectivity and the input parameters, which are these four things here, and Q is just the different fraction of you know, inhibitory cells to excitatory cells that one has, one can write down uh, basically this distribution. One can write down the mean and the variance of the Gaussian distribution that when pushed through the nonlinearity gives you this form. And the, the reason why we care about this is because one can actually just write the whole thing down <laughs> basically. Uh, and then what you wanna do is you wanna minimize that explicit error function that links what are the distribution of your inputs as a function of the parameters of your model with the target function that you fit it to the data. Uh, and you can do that, you know, like for the different cell types and the different stimuli conditions. And by minimizing that, um, one can find recurrent network models that can capture the distribution of cell types and how they change uh, with the stimulus contrast for these small stimulus, yeah. Um, hey, yeah. Uh, so before you proceed, just a clarification. So all of these just instantaneous interactions, uh, any estimate of the relative time delays in the, the circuits you are working with? This is all steady state. So this is all steady state. There is, there are no yet temporal dynamics here. Um, so I mean, like, and we assume. All right. Okay, I see. And we assume that there are no um, delayed interactions. I do know from the work that you looked at today that if you put delays and they are small enough, it's mm -hmm. not gonna matter. And then if they are sufficiently long, you will have some oscillation collapse. Um, uh, so it's, that there is not even dynamics, just to- This is a steady state. state. Yeah, sorry, I didn't clarify that. I think in the data, when the, these distributions are not over time, they are over cells of steady state activity, they present a drifting grading. And you actually see, you know, like in the monkey, you see the same thing. There is a transient, and then there is something like a steady state. So they take the average of that activity over time. Um, the yes. Calcium, the calcium is over time, or are they? Yeah. Just to clarify, are the recordings in you know, all these cell types in the same sessions, or are they sort of separate? Yeah, different mice. <laughs> we have no way of knowing. Uh, whether so doesn't matter you mean like whether if I would have so maybe better answer is there there are experiments in which they they do sequencing of the cell type after the experiment and I have not tried to refeed my model with that data so I do not know if that matters in that sense like whether I would recover the same thing um, but at this point in time you know like but that's what I guess the assumption is that the connectivity matrices are stable across. Exactly. Yeah. Also, because we are not really, I mean, yeah, okay. it's just like it's sufficiently broad that it's not tailored to each of the animals. On the other hand, what I am going to show you actually, like right now, is what are the connectivity parameters that we obtain uh, and the way that people have measure that experimentally is also in different animals. So in a way, like those experiments also have an animal average. And so in that sense, it's a fair comparison, I guess. Um, 
sorry for the exclusivity. So in the model, there is no distinction between um, different subgroups of uh, individual cells, right? It's just exactly. Uh, yeah. So I forcefully include included all the connections, and now I want to see, you know, what is the data telling me about that connectivity? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I told you that I had a I had a block matrix like this, and that this has a mean and a variance that depends on the cell type pair. And what I'm showing you here is the posterior distribution across the family of models of this parameter, the mean connectivity across cell types. And what you see is that there are some connections that are broad. For example, the excitatory to excitatory. Well, you cannot really see. I'm sorry about that. Um, so this is zero three minus three zero minus one zero minus one zero, the x-axis of this. So these are distributions again, like a histogram. Um, and what you see is that there are distributions that are really like clamped at zero, right? From VIP uh, to the excitatory parvalumin and to itself. There are distributions that they look a little bit more by model. Uh, we don't really know what's going on here. Um, but there are distributions that are broader. Um, and in particular, what one can do is to say, well, um, if I now just take the kind of the mean of these distributions, we could also take, you know, like the maximum, the maximum of the posterior, uh, same thing. Um, I am putting a cross here where this where the connection is like sufficiently small. Um, and this is a, this is kind of a proxy of the connectivity that was reported experimentally. We normalized this in the same way that this experimental data was normalized. And what we observe is that the connections that we are unable to recover, they were also unable to be tested, like found, they were not found experimentally. So what you're seeing here is the, the average connectivity across, so the way that these experiments are done, sorry, I should explain that, is they have one cell type, they, they induce an action potential in one cell, and then they measure the EPSP, so the excitatory personality potentials in different cells, and they categorize them depending on the cell type that are source and target, and then they build this matrix here. Uh, and it has a normalization that we also use that is dividing by the PV to PV connection, I think. Um, and so these are, there are three because they come from different labs. The first estimation of this connectivity was done by the Scanciani lab. Um, this is the Rafa Yuste lab at Columbia, and this is the Allen data set. Um, and what you can see is that although there are some connections that, you know, like it looks less clear whether they are there or not. A, an example, for example, is the PV2 somatostatin. Here it looks like it doesn't exist, but in other estimations, it looks like it is there, but it's smaller. You can see that there are a lot of um, there is a lot of overlap um, in the structure of this connectivity. Yes. This is all layer two three. Or? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, layer two three mouse v one all of them. This this one uh, is also s one. They average the entire thing. So yeah. So I started with a circuit like this. Um, then we looked at what would be a and we looked at ways of inferring parameters that would lead to fitting the entire distribution of activity in these RNNs. Uh, and then what we found is that to explain the data, there are some connections that should not be there. Um, and so just to summarize this first part, uh, I told you that I started with a model that is interpretable. We uh, and it's at a good level of granularity. And the, the reason why I make this statement is because at this level of granularity, we can recover the structure of the connectivity. Um, I told you that I, instead of, you know, like training RNNs and doing costly minimizations, I used, <laughs> sorry, I used, um, I used a way of leveraging the theoretical tractability of this network to actually write down simple equations that can be minimized uh, sufficiently fast. Um, I told you that this, um, this inference method allows us to recover the structure of the connectivity. And I also told you that the posterior distribution that, that I found is broad. There is a large degeneracy, but actually one thing that we tested and I am not reporting here is that if you do perturbations on this circuit, uh, they look quite similar. 
um, you can distinguish a little bit of different types of models, uh, but it's not giving us, you know, like the, the posterior is broad, but that doesn't mean that they are like an uncountable number of mechanisms uh, mediating these changes in activity. Uh, the network. So that's so yeah. sorry to insist on this. So the, what is the data actually here? It's just some some proxy for mean firing rates in some very large time window, and you call that the state? Is that? Yeah, but actually, like for example, from electoral recordings, if you look at visual cortex data, when you present a, a, a drifting grading, it's true that the activity is not, you know, like flat, but it's the fluctuations are small. If I would put noise here, you would get something that looks like that. Yeah, but that, to, to get a very concrete. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what is that? You are averaging some activity over what? Over time but, for each yeah, cell. Like what, second? Yeah, um, yeah, that's exactly right. That's the second. So they okay. so the experiments are they present on stimulus, it lasts one second. Then I think that they have a half a second uh, reset to baseline, and then they present another one, something like that, or maybe one second between stimuli. It's quite fast. I mean, I do agree with that, especially for calcium. Um, but it, it, that's right, yeah. Sorry, I missed the details of the, the method used to uh, estimate the synaptic rates. Is the solution unique to every generation? No, it's not. I mean, no, there is a broad posterior. Right, okay. Yeah, no, it's not right. it's not unique at all. I think that's did you show us I missed the posterior sorry. Yeah, it's these distributions oh, are over different models of this parameter. I see, sorry. That is the mean. Yeah. Um so one of the things that, that I did uh, after that was to look at, for example, perturbations of cell type specific perturbations, like large numbers. Uh, I am going to show a little bit of the theoretical formalism that one can use to actually describe those perturbations. But in principle, um, one of the things that I found very important is that although the numbers themselves, they are really different, the way that the, the network behaves is very similar, not only because it fits the data so that you put by hand, but when you do perturbations, qualitatively, the perturbations look the same. You don't get like completely different uh, things. Um, yeah, so in the introduction, I told you that excitatory cells and parabolomine cells, they many times go together. And so here, just for, for sorry, I'm giving my bag to some people. Um, let's think about it for as a single unit for a moment. Um, and let's just think about this circuit. So in this circuit, we have that VIP interneurons, they only project to somatostatin interneurons. So these are the only, you know, like it's only bright, it's private inhibition. Um, and these two are bidirectionally connected. They engage in competitive dynamics. And in particular, you, if you, for example, would have an increase in the input of somatostatin interneurons, which is something that would have, if you have a very large stimulus, um, these large stimuli have been shown to increase somatostatin interneurons. The reason for that is that these cells, they have a very broad and dendritic tree. And so they integrate from, from broad uh, places, uh, broad space, broad in the space. Um, so for example, if that happens, that would lead to inhibition, uh, direct inhibition to the pyramidal cells and also to the VIP cells. Um, but if you give inputs to the VIP interneurons that, for example, coming from top-down inputs or like neuromodulatory inputs, that would lead to a decrease of activity of the somatostatin cells and the release of inhibition from somatostatin onto the excitatory cell would lead to what is called VIP mediated disinhibition. So this is something that has been shown to exist all across cortex. Um, people have proposed that actually this disinhibition is something that uh, gates learning. Like, in, in, yeah, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> um, and in particular, it was also proposed that locomotion uh, enters the cell through neuromodulation of the VIP interneurons. Yeah. Is the do your connections have dynamics in them, or are they just on or off? They have numbers, so yeah. they are. Just wait. They are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of slow. 
Is no, but that's in the steady state. Like, yeah. So you mean slow? You mean what do you mean by slow? I mean the GABA urgent um, counterparts. Oh no, because I mean these are rate units. Yeah, like we don't really have synapses, but yeah, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no. I thought that for a moment I thought that you were talking about like short term plasticity, which I also don't have here, um, which also changes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this, um, there is a lot of work to do to understand the circuit, I think, in terms of the temporal dynamics. But here, um, the way that we are thinking about it, uh, it's just like kind of broad changes, broad changes in, in, in activity at the population level. Um, also, because this assumption of the steady state in the visual cortex is what we are doing here. I mean, like, this would not, this would not be a good model of pretty much any other area, I think. Uh, and the area that like, you would have temporal dynamics. Things that in these networks, the temporal dynamics that you can have, they come from, they are either like a red network, you see their steady state or chaotic. Oscillations are more complicated here. Uh, and you can have fluctuations by having, you know, like noise that you inject, and then you can understand how this noise, for example, propagates through the network. Which is a little bit of a different question. Um, Can I ask a follow up question? I don't yeah, no, please go ahead. I think, I mean, please, you can leave. The steady state is a given limit, right? When you give these visual gradings to a mouse or a human, you see this huge gamma response. Yeah, that's that right. Stays on. Um, and it depends on contrast, too. Yeah, yeah and it changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, would this account for that in any way, or how Actually, do you expand this to? Yeah, I, I mean that that is something that depends on the model, and I have not quantified it. But if you grab one model and you just make the simulation, because here I am feeding the steady state, right? But when you do the simulation, you have transient dynamics towards that steady state, and they are oscillatory most times. Um, and then, like the period of the oscillation depends on the time constant, but the you know the steady state doesn't. So like a time constant in the steady state, the only thing that it does is to change the stability of the circuit, but it doesn't really change anything else. Um, Just get a bit of intuition of why in the steady state there might be bimodal modality. It seems like some of the distributions were somewhat bimodal. I don't have a good intuition. Yeah, I, no, in the, the model does not generate bimodal distributions. Oh, this, that's the data. and. I think that there, what's happening is that there are there is a particular subtype of VIP cells that actually decreases its activity with contrast from the get go, uh, and we they didn't have the genetic marker to separate those two, and so we are clamping them together as a single population uh, when they are actually receiving different inputs. They are different things, so I would need to model that separately or allow for a single cell type population to have you know kind of substructure. Which I think is, you know, like I think that an interesting question in the future is how can you, in an unsupervised way, find functional cell types? You know, say like, oh, okay, I have distributions of things that I can parameter parameterize with how many populations can I get away describing, you know, a certain amount of things. But he and just a very quick follow up, and I'll let you continue. But uh, will you be able to distinguish that kind of explanation for the model by modality from, for example, in your the assumption that you're modeling the average animal and that they're all the same as opposed to yeah but then you would need to have so i think that like it depends it depends on the assumption of how this animal connectivity is distributed right like i think that if you would have multiple animals the assumption would be that if there is some heterogeneity is unless you have so yeah i've been told by the experimentalists that you do have two type of mice the lazy mice and the <laughs> and, the, and the and the overachiever <laughs> And that they run very differently. So I don't know, maybe there are kind of two subclasses of these breeds, you know, like they are very specific. That I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, well, yeah. And so the question here um, it was proposed uh, like almost a decade ago. And the proposal is a serious one that, that they say is like, okay, we observed that in the dark, VIP interneurons really increase their activity with locomotion. The animal runs, it's not seeing anything, and VIP is going crazy. Uh, so this is what it's found experimentally. And so what people thought is like, ah, okay, so this is what locomotion is doing, is activating this disinhibitory circuit. Um, so that on the one hand, 
And on the other hand, people have gone and put, you know, like have measured what is the effect of locomotion as early as the visual uh, thalamus in the LGN. And you actually have, you know, like tuning curves of running speed in the visual thalamus. So there is already locomotion information arriving to cortex, you know, like even before any feedback. It's Directly so there. It has nothing to do with uh, auditive hormone, so it's in the dark. So yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I know there are many experts on, on locomotion here. I know very little about it in comparison, but it seems to be a very broad signal uh, that it's, you know, like, it's they, like the cortex doesn't even need to be there. Uh, for locomotion in many animals, definitely not in the mouse. Um, and somehow from that point of view, it's, it's, it's very different than in skill movement. Um, it's also surprising because like skill movements are also, one can decode them from the visual cortex of the mouse. And I think that that's totally crazy, but locomotion seems to be a very broad signal. Uh, and um, yeah, and it's there, even if there is no visual information. But as I am going to show you in a second, it does get even more intense with visual uh, input. Yeah, so what I'm going to show you now is that basically this is inhibitory circuit doesn't match the data that we have. Um, and our, our modeling work points towards something more related to this that it's going to actually link back uh, to the third project. So what I'm going to show you now is to say, well, okay, I have this model and that I should show you about the response to visual um, stimuli when the animal is in a stationary condition. And now we are going to look at the changes in activity with locomotion. I am going to find that a direct input to excitatory cells is very important. And then I am going to study the direct input to excitatory cells in isolation um, in this third part through optogenetic perturbation of activity. Um, you can see this, right? So yeah, sorry, the zero is not centered, but this is zero here. This is a distribution of changes in activity of VIP cells when the animal is running or not running. So you have an animal, it's running, you record the cells, you grab its cell, you subtract the activity when the animal is not running, you make a histogram, and this is, this is what one gets. And according to this uh, kind of disinhibitory picture, one would expect that the excitatory population also has a huge, increase in activity with locomotion in the absence of visual stimulation. But that is not what we find. Um, actually, this is zero here. None of the other cell types has a pronounced change in the mean activity with locomotion. But when you put a visual stimulus with locomotion in the absence of visual stimulation, but when a visual st stimulus is present, everything goes up with locomotion. So that is, kind of confusing uh, of what is actually happening. There is not only, um, there is there is a, there seems to be a signal that, or locomotory signal that depends on contrast. And that is in a way uh, kind of in line with thinking that this locomotory signal comes together um, with the visual information and that there is some sort of nonlinear gain um, going on. So, what I am going to show you now is how, what I, what I was interested in is to say, well, this inhibition would mean that there are inputs to VIP and that is driving this entire change in activity. Um, so what I'm gonna ask is, which are the inputs to each cell type population that I could put in such that I can recover these changes, this, this entire set of changes? Um, and to do that, I, uh, I follow up on work that was done uh, in Ken Miller's lab in which they, they use, basically they developed this random matrix theory framework that what allows you to do is to say, okay, given that you have distribution of inputs to a cell type population. And what I, but what I mean by that is like in your population, you put current in each of these cells, and this input comes from a distribution that has a given mean, G, for each cell type alpha and a, and a given variance, D. Um, 
And what you're interested in is that when you do that perturbation in each cell type population, what are the changes in activity that you have for each cell type population, meaning these curves here. Um, and what is pretty about that is that with some linear and Gaussian approximations as always, what one can do is to write basically the changes in activity of each population as a function of a lot of parameters. But I remind you that all of the parameters that are here, they were already inferred in the model of the stationary data. So I have parameters that are related to, for example, the fraction of cells that receive this locomotor input, some gains that are just derivatives of the input output function, uh, some, some parameters about the, the, it doesn't actually matter so much, um, but you have a lot of parameters that I already fit in. Uh, and the only three parameters in these equations are basically the mean and the variances of the input. And so what one can do is to numerically invert this. And what this would tell me is what are the inputs that I would give to each cell type population that could explain the changes in activity in the by locomotion. Yes? Yes. Um, and so just to repeat that, we have explicit expressions to a response to perturbations. I evaluate them with the parameters of the model fit of the stationary data. And for each model from that entire posterior that was brought, I infer the perturbation parameters that generate this locomotion compatible changes in activity. Uh, and therefore I can say something about which are the inputs that each cell type is receiving in each case. Um, and so when I do that, I can kind of fit again, you know, like the changes in activity per cell type and as a function of the stimulus contrast, and I can show you now what are the inputs that each cell type receives. And this, is, this input depends on contrast. Uh, there is nothing that we can do about that. And what I, what I find is that there is a large input to the VIP cell, which is something that was reported experimentally. Uh, we knew that it receives cholinergic inputs from the basal cell brain, so that was known. But what the model also finds is that the inputs to somatostatin interneurons are also very large. Um, and that the inputs to excitatory cells and parvabulmin are smaller, but they are still there. So here you're seeing lines and shaded, uh, and shaded areas. These are basically the means across the models, the different models that feed the data. And that's also what I meant by, um, you have a question? No, okay. Um, <laughs> Just bring <a> question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but right. what, yeah. So the, so the plot or the way you are saying seems to suggest some sort of a additive locomotion input as the contrast increase, but it could be just like multiplicative gain. So the locomotor is still just fixed at the same level. It's just the contrast that is yeah. using multiply. So what, what's happening? I don't think I have, I think that in this case, those two things are the same because the inputs are linearly added to the recurrent circuit. So I just have an input and that input will be, you know, like a, a visual input and a locomotor input. If you take a contrast as a common factor, because this is linear, uh, you will just have a number. So it will be... Right, but so could you put your model discriminate additive versus multiplicative interaction between locomotion and contrast? Not here, because the approximation that I did here, it, it is, it's, it's a linear response calculation, this one. So I think that, yes, you're totally right. So just to... To do this, what I'm doing is I am linearizing the system around the steady state. Uh, and then using this framework of heterogeneous uh, distributions. But there is an assumption that this, that this, there is an assumption that this input is linear. Um, so I don't think that here could be, the, I mean, numerically, that, that's something obviously that one can investigate, but um, yeah, not here, unfortunately. Although I do have to say that um, what I'm going to tell you now, I, I did other parametrizations of this contrast, um, you know, how it depends on contrast, what rad, like something like a square root. I even allow it to depend on contrast, you know, like in, in many other ways. And 
the key insights that I'm about to show you doesn't depend on that. But yeah. So the key insight is what is actually happening at the circuit level. I told you that the VIP and somatostatic interaction is a competition that regulates contextual modulations in vision. And so we were very surprised to think about that being, you know, that locomotion is involved in change in that competition. Um, and what you're seeing here is basically through the model, what one can ask is how much of the changes in excitatory activity with locomotion come from a VIP modulation of activity, come from this input, and how much it comes from this input, right? We know that directly there are inputs to excitation, uh, but if, for example, if VIP is winning the competition, then there will be disinhibition of the excitatory cell, and then we are going to see, um, I am going to basically show you that for each model, there will be a point, and the points here would mean that those models have this inhibition as a mechanism to mediate um, locomotion, meaning that this is what's happening. And in this case, uh, mean if, if the points are here, it would be that somatostatin won this competition, and therefore, um, you know, like, this is directly inhibiting excitatory cells, and there is no competition at all. And in the absence of visual stimulation, you know, when there is like in the dark, we know that the, 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 the pyramidal cell activity doesn't change at all. So we expect that there is cancellation of the effect of somatostatin and VIP in excitation. Nothing's happening that we knew. The question is here, and in the, in the configuration in which we have full contrast, um, what's happening there? People have proposed that it's disinhibition. And what I find is that it is still canceling each other. So there seems to be, um, although everyone is receiving inputs, the inputs that some of the Satin and VIP are receiving are matched in strength such that this competition is being canceled. And actually one can show theoretically under these linear response assumptions that the change in any cell type activity uh, given that you put an input to somatostatin and you put it or you put it to VIP is proportional to one another with a constant that one can compute. So this is something that one would expect in this simple case in which you have populations competing with one another. Um, so basically the conclusion from this part is that everyone receives inputs, but they receive inputs in such a way that although there is an increasing gain of the VIP activity, the competition is not touched. Uh, these two cells are still competing as much as they were uh, for each uh, for each condition of the visual stimulation. Um, okay, I'm gonna summarize this part. Uh, and so basically what I show you today is that this is kind of a different way of looking at inference. Um, I looked at, I, I, I was interested in this kind of inverse problem of like, usually we have a system and we wanna, we wanna look at the perturbation. Now the data, I can look at per perturbations of activity that come naturally, for example, from, from locomotion and ask what are the inputs that I need to give to that circuit to account for that change in activity. Um, and what I told you is that the, the kind of, the neural mechanism that we find is that the cancellation between the somatostatin and VIP activity uh, that for us looked like a very reasonable thing to happen or a reasonable way that the, the system can preserve uh, contextual modulation mechanisms that have been shown to be useful before. Um, and also it, this makes a very concrete prediction about the cold inertia inputs to somatostatin interneurons. We know that layer two, three somatostatin cells do not receive feed forward inputs from layer four. Uh, so this should be a cholinergic input and that is something that we are interested in trying to test. Um, and I, yeah, and so in this last part, um, I think, yeah, <laughs> you're free to go if this was too long. I've been 50 minutes already. Or, or should I just stop here? Yeah. Um, so here, the conclusion of this is like, okay, there is cancellation of VIP and somatostatin, but if I were to clamp, uh, you know, these interneurons together, what it's really driving the changes in locomotion are pyramidal cells, inputs to pyramidal cells. And so this is what I studied in this third part. This is a collaboration with uh, with Nicolas Brunel uh, and uh, Alejandro Alessandro Sanseni, 
Um, and this is kind of the first paper in a sequence uh, of things that we have been looking at, uh, all related to just the effect of perturbation of excitatory cells. And so here we have this great mouse. Um, and so optogenetics for those that I doubt that that's the case, but basically what they can do is to grab a mouse and you know making it express a channel that is activated through light. In the monkey, you cannot do that from the get-go, so they inject the virus and it does it in, in a tiny area. So there is already a change, like there is already a difference on how these perturbations go in different species. Um, but the experiment, uh, the, the visual stimulus is the same as before. Here, the, the gradients are larger. Uh, they are a little bit larger than the ones that I presented, but not that much more. And in the monkey, they are much smaller, uh, matching receptive field size in the monkey. Um, and yeah, so I usually try to do a drawing. So this is a cumulative density function. Yeah, like the only. This is, uh, this is just a very simple thing, but like I think that just for in case. So if you have a, a Gaussian distribution, this is a PDF, right? Now, if you what I'm what I'm showing here is the cumulative, which is the integration up to this point, like here is the this point here is the integral of this up to this point. And so it's a different way of showing the data. Um, and I just wanted to clarify that because unless that is clarified, I will lose you all. Um, and so here, here what you see is this distribution basically in white is in the absence of visual stimulation and in the absence of optogenetic perturbation, just the activity of the visual cortex. There is um, spontaneous activity and the cells form a distribution. And now when you make an optogenetic perturbation, that distribution changes, it shifts to the right, um, as you would expect, you know, you're injecting current on excitatory cells that changes. Now in the monkey, you see a very similar thing. There is a cumulative density function and you know, it's shifted to the right um, with the optogenetic perturbation. Now, when, when instead of being in the dark, you have a stimulus in the mouse, nothing really changes. So the distribution of activity is already shifted by the visual stimulus. It gets shifted a little bit more by the optogenetic perturbation. But in the monkey, this kind of weird thing occurs in which you don't really have a change of the distribution of activity at all. Uh, and one can think, oh, maybe the perturbation is too weak and the animal is not feeling it. But if you go in and you look at the changes in activity per cell, the distribution across the population of the changes in activity, you know, they are large changes. In the mouse, um, the distribution looks like this. This is the same that I was looking for locomotion now for the optogenetic perturbation. This has a positive mean and a large variance. And in the monkey, it's the zero mean and a large variance, meaning that this is equivalent, meaning that basically each cell really changes its activity, but the population itself, it's staying the same. It's like if I would ask you to swap and you should count the number of people that they are in each row, that would stay the same, but the distance uh, between where you are and where you were, it changes. Um, and so the first thing to note about this data is that the mean changes in rates are small compared to the standard deviation. And in fact, if you put them in a single plot um, and you plot what is the, the ratio between the mean of this distribution and the standard deviation of this distribution as a function of the, of the baseline fine rate, um, you see that there is a continuum between the mouse and the monkey, which is kind of quite remarkable. Um, just like as an observation, yeah, like the fine, the mean fine rate of the monkey uh, is around 100 something, and of the mouse is much smaller than that. They are like almost a factor of three uh, between this and this. Um, and so what this tells us is that maybe what is happening here is that you have animals that they live in different regimes out of sheer change in, in, in fine rate. Um, and in the monkey, the distribution of activity remains the same after the optogenetic perturbation, as I just said. And this is somewhat quite um, puzzling, um, especially because imagine that you have, you have a fine rate that comes from a distribution of fine rates, right? So this, and it has a variance that I call this. And now I grab, I grab this fine rate and I add 
I add something, a change in firing rate, that is this delta R. And now I look at the distribution of the sum of these two things. This is something that always apply, right? Like the, the, the variance of the sum of two random variables can be written down like the variance of one plus the variance of the other, plus two times the covariance between these two rates. Um, and so if this is the thing that this, which is what the data is telling us, right? That the variance of the distribution after the perturbation and before the perturbation is the same, then what you end up getting is that the, the, there is a magnitude that you can define that is the normalized covariance that should be approaching minus one half. And in fact, if you go to the data and you plot this, this, um, this covariance, uh, this normalized covariance in the mouse and in the monkey, you see that in the mouse, this is very close to zero. Actually, it's never significantly different from zero. But in the monkey, the higher the fine rate is, the closer you are to this theoretical limit of what we call reshuffling of activity, that basically this perturbation is just changing um, the activity altogether. Um, so to analyze this, we did the most complicated thing that one could do completely unnecessarily. <laughs> well, I don't know if it was unnecessarily, but I, I, I just want to show you the full model because we are still studying this system but the theoretical insights that we got was from the simple model. Uh, and many of you can guess already that disynaptic inhibition is what really matters there. And you have um, you know, a lot of inhibition that is elicited by this perturbation and that's leading to a lot of cancellation. But I was very interested in this difference. Um, intuitively for me, I thought, well, if what we are having here is in a strongly connected system that has a lot of disynaptic inhibition, in the monkey brain, in the visual cortex, you have orientation columns, this beautiful aperiodic map. And basically what this means is that cells that are close by together, they are more strongly connected. So I would expect that on average, you have a stronger connectivity here than here. So we started here. Um, yeah, and so just to clarify, these different dots are the orientation preference of each cell. And in the mouse, this is a salt and pepper arrangement. Whereas in the monkey, it has this aperiodic map that many people have characterized um, across the gates. Um, and so we had two layers. I am not going to look at interneurons here because we only have information about the excitatory population. So we only have one inhibitory population. Um, and basically, what um, the way that this model is built is to have, you know, like the, the acids measured in cortex. The connectivity between two cells depends, it's, it's weaker the further away you are in space and in feature preference. Uh, and so this is all what this means. Um, and then we said, okay, so this model is quite complicated. I cannot use the trick that I showed you before. Um, what I am going to do is to say, I'm going to define a set of summary statistics, meaning like the mean fine rate of the population as a function, sorry, let me just pull it all. The mean of the fine rate as a function of contrast in the absence of an optogenetic perturbation, in the presence of an optogenetic perturbation, the standard deviation of those. So this is the same that I had in my first model. But now I am also going to include the standard deviation of the changes in rain, which is kind of constant. And importantly, this parameter that tells us how much reshuffling there is in the network is caused by the optogenetic uh, perturbation. Yeah. Um, good. So this is what we want to reproduce. And so we did uh, like just we just train a multilayer perception. So the way that this is done is like grab this this model. Uh, we start with some parameter. We simulate it. We generate some summary statistics, and then you you train this multilayer perception to do that mapping. And then you say, okay, I am going to choose with some I don't know a, a least squared error. What are the parameters that can capture the data the best? and you can do it. And we were very happy with this because, yeah, I think we thought that was cool, but then it was like, okay, we don't really get what's going on still. Um, and so we got back to the simple model in which there is no orientation preference or structure. And the reason to do that is because here, one can do the math that I was uh, explaining before. And in fact, one can extend, you know, like this kind of mean field theory to not only account for the mean and the variance of the distribution of activity, but you can really account for 
the changes in activity induced by the optogenetic perturbation, and importantly, the correlation between the baseline fine rate and the change in fine rate induced by the optogenetic perturbation. And the intuition here is if you have a fine rate that's a positive magnitude, if the activity, if the baseline activity is low, the only thing that the optogenetic stimulus can do is increase it. Whereas if the activity is high, it can increase or decrease, and it ends up being decreased by disynaptic inhibition. Um, right. And so this just to show you like the theory that we did works. Um, these are the dots are simulations and the lines are the theory. But the insight that we get from this theory is that if your weak, your coupling is weak, the connections among and across excitatory and inhibitory cells are small. Um, and you make an optogenetic perturbation to the excitatory cells, the type of plot that you end up getting is this, that the change in rate is basically positively correlated with the baseline fine rate. So if the activity levels are more or less weak, you perturb it, everything can increase. Whereas if the, if the connectivity is strong and you have very strong coupling, and in particular, very strong disynaptic inhibition, when you hit this, the first thing that is going to happen is that you're going to have this kind of inhibitory combat that is going to cancel a lot of these perturbations. So this is a balance mechanism. And a typical, a typical type of um, blood that you get when you do that is that the change in rate you know, is visually negatively correlated with the baseline rate. And this intuition that I just told you is what happens, you know, if the fire rate is small, you have increases in activity. If it's large, you will have a lot of suppression. Um, and, you know, like there are concerns about that model, like first that the perturbation uh, to the monkeys um, can be more sparse because it's virally expressed, uh, whereas the, the mice can be very strong. So maybe that's what's actually happening. Um, and, but there was another concern related to to feature preference. So in the monkey, usually when people do measurements in the visual cortex, they really select those cells that are preferred by the, that have the orientation preference matching the visual stimulus. So maybe we were, you know, we were making an entire theory based on a, an experimental fact, which is that these cells, you know, they are tuned to have high firing rates because you're choosing those that have high firing rates. Um, um, yeah, um, and the, the only take home message from this slide is that if you now grab and incorporate orientation, what you're going to find, I know this is maybe, uh, was a little bit too much material, but the take home message here is if you have fine rates that are high, um, in the recurrent network model, you can account for the experimental results. But if you're interested in only looking at the cells that have an orientation preference that matches the stimulus, you need to have a model that incorporates that orientation preference. And if you do that, what you can find after you, you will have, for example, this is, well, so just explaining this plot, is you have different cells, they have different orientation preference. You prefer, you present a stimulus that has a certain orientation. Now, the inputs that this is going to, this network is going to receive are going to have a peak at the orientation of the stimulus. And now what you want to understand is what are the changes in the recurrent input of each of these cells when you do an optogenetic perturbation, which doesn't have an orientation preference, right? You are perturbing all cells equally. And basically what, what one finds in this case is that the change in the input of each of these cells is gonna be net inhibitory for those cells that have high activity levels, the ones that have an orientation preference that matches the stimulus and are going to be excitatory otherwise. So basically what this means is that you will have very localized disynaptic inhibition in the cells that have a similar orientation to the stimulus and will be excitatory otherwise. And the reason why this was important for us is multiple things. First, there are people that have measured optogenetic perturbations in the excitatory populations of monkeys, and they have not seen reshuffling. So they saw a little bit of an increased excitatory activity. And we were interested in saying, oh, maybe these are differences because of the recording procedure. So we were interested in this. And then I personally find it very interesting that, you know, like the brain 
knows what are the tumor cells and it, like it affects differently. This, this homogeneous perturbation doesn't affect all the cells the same. It matters which cell is which um, for this perturbation. And it will leave the ones that are un, the ones that are tuned unchanged for a perturbation that it's not uh, you know, like relevant for the visual students. Um, questions in this part? Um, I think I rushed a little bit over it. I, it's, one hour 10 is a lot of time, a lot of long time to sit through a talk. Um, I just want to leave you with this message maybe for tomorrow, which is, so these are the changes in activity induced by an excitatory perturbation. These are the changes in activity induced by locomotion in mouse and in monkeys from, from Alex Hack lab. Um, you see that you have a mean positive change in activity with locomotion in the mouse as in the optogenetic perturbation and a zero mean change in the monkeys. And uh, this is also for the tune cells. Uh, so, these are the type of parallels that um, I was referring to when I said that optogenetic perturbations of E cells has something to do with locomotion. Um, yeah, and just to summarize this part, I told you that optogenetic perturbations have this kind of reshuffling property. There is a lot of disynaptic inhibition. Um, I also told you that some of the statistics that we find make these animals lie on a continuum. And actually we fitted the same model to mouse and monkeys that I didn't show here. Uh, and basically it, this change in the strength of the connectivity is very important. Um, and the last thing I told you is that a structural connectivity allows us to really disambiguate the effect of cells depending on their orientation preference. Uh, and basically these cells are able to, with the recurrent connectivity are able to cancel the external input. Uh, they are able to cancel inputs that are not related to the visual stimulus. Um, yeah, and so maybe I go through the future directions uh, some other like, tomorrow. This, um... how, how much time do you need? <laughs> like 10, 15 minutes. I'm not sure how this is so long. I... <laughs> well, we, we stopped you quite a bit. Uh, I'm so sorry. No, I mean, let me just like summarize it a little bit. So this is the only thing that I want you to take away uh, from this is the following. I told you that the type of theory that I've been working with and the type of theory that we know how to do is theory that tells us, you know, how to compute means and variances and distributions. And, and the problem or same problem myself, is <laughs> maybe it's too strong, yeah, but like Locomotion changes all these things in the same way that the visual input changes all these things. So what I think that it's needed to be done is to have a theory that allows us to look at other features of the activity that are not this. Uh, and in particular, I am very inspired by the by the geometry work that many people have looked at, in which you basically, you know, what what you're what I'm so maybe I should explain this. So here again, you have a mouse. It sees um, different stimuli of different orientations. Um, if you do some dimensionality reduction, this is UMAP, you will see that different stimuli span this ring, the different orientation, that's okay. Now, if you color each of these points is one trial, and now if you color code it by whether the mouse is stationary or in locomotion, Stringer showed that, you know, this, um, the, the visual dimensions and the motor dimensions, they span mostly orthogonal cell spaces. Here, what I did is I just plotted it in a way in which you can see that it is really a very particular translation that you have. Um, and one of the things that we do not know how to do is to have theories that can build these representational geometries. We know how to, for example, include low rank connectivity that can lead you to, you know, like dynamics on particular manifolds. Um, but how to do this such that we can link it back to the data is something that I think that we're missing. I think this is like the direction that I want to go is to build theories that allow us to do similar work to the one that I have been doing that really can relate to experiments, cell type specific recordings and cell type specific perturbations and also incorporate dynamics, which are clearly missing here and very important for locomotion. Um, and then really explore the possibility that this orthogonality that we are seeing is because in this setting, the mouse is running by seeing a stimulus that is not changing. And whenever we start to build 
um, sensory motor associations in our experiments, we will start to see that this is no longer orthogonal. And in that case, I would think that visual cortex is not, you know, like just passively representing these motor signals, but it's doing something else. It's really using them to build kind of a more complicated representation uh, for transmission downstream. Um, so this is basically the summary uh, of what I had here. And with that, I'd like to conclude. So yeah, this is a very important slide. Um, so the experiments were done in Kilela Desnick's lab. This is part of a U19 collaboration with Kilela and, and Massimo. Um, in the monkey mouse project, the mouse data came from Mark Pistet and the primates data came from John Reynolds. This was published before we came in. Um, so Francesco Comarola is the person that uh, did the random matrix theory before I came into Columbia. My supervisor is Ken Miller. Um, I didn't project it, I didn't present a dialography project, but I'm working with a PhD student, Hoshin Chao, on that. And the reshuffling theory, as I said, was a was a collaboration with the Nicolas Brunel um, lab at Duke. Alex Anceni was a postdoc there, uh, and Twan is a PhD student at Columbia with whom we are uh, currently finalizing the spatial theory part, like the main field of that uh, with the perturbation. Yeah, uh, so thank you for your attention. I'm sorry about how long it was. Want to take questions? So yeah, for sure. Sorry. <laughs> I was just like looking down if people want to leave. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, like the Lea Dunker. Dun yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, yeah, maybe to summarize for people, what they're finding is that uh, the stimulating the monkeys and motor cortex is either active or stimulated. And they find that less the stimulation curves the movement, whereas active is not. And when they look at what they do to analyze neural data, they do the analytical analysis, and they find that the less the stimulation perturbs. Neural activity in the direction of the monkey. The question though is, is your observation of the two shuffling that actually, do you think that would actually be consistent with that, that this idea of orthogonal perturbations? Yeah, no, great question. Actually, I, I'm close friends with Leah and we are like trying to understand how our data gives because, like, this is a reshuffling around the mean. And actually, when she looks at her optogenetic perturbations of excitatory cells as well, she does not see a shock. So if you if you just plot the distribution of changes, it doesn't have a zero mean. Do you think that's the difference between sensory and motor cortex? Yeah, we are thinking about that hard because also like the perturbation, so like motor cortex is generating dynamics, like V1 is like here we are completely neglecting them. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what's the difference, but I think there's super exciting difference, honestly, like, um, because I mean, like, one of the things that what I would like to ask, for example, is like, if I would look at, like, something that we didn't do, and we obviously should try to to do in our model, is just look at kind of some dimensionality reduction technique to see what that perturbation is doing around the representation of geometry. Um, but we haven't, um, and yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, how much do you think the monkey that results uh, is like the whole Yeah, well, so. Um, in the models, actually, so one of the, how to organize these thoughts. So there are two, so one of the things to say is, yeah, if the finding rates were lower and our models would predict that the connectivity are weaker, it doesn't need to be that the connections themselves are weaker. It's just that, you know, like the nonlinear gain uh, that gives you this effective connectivity is weaker. So if the activity levels are smaller, is effectively less connected. And you would expect that you don't see full reshuffling. And actually that's what happens in the monkey in the absence of visual stimulation. The network is not so, so driven. And then you make a perturbation and you see that there are changes, but they don't have zero mean. So that's what I would predict. But then, I mean, auditory cortex is a different beast here, like a, 
it has, so I, I'm, I'm also very interested in that because locomotion has this opposite effect in, in auditory cortex, right? It has decrease of the activity actually instead of increasing. So maybe, you know, like there is this cancellation that can be perfect in V1, maybe it's not, and you have more inhibition. So I, I would love to get my hands on some V1 data, uh, sorry, A1 data to analyze it, but it's not immediate uh, that the circuit is like just that. It's just more weekly bubble. Yes. Hi, thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, one of the things that I'm a little, I'm still feeling a little bit puzzling is that previously you mentioned that in prior literature that people can decode with a like running speed from all of them inside of the results, right? They can decode what? Uh, the, for example, like the running speed. Oh yeah, yeah. Results, right. Um. So and you also said that all of the inhibitory excitations or connections were balanced, even with all of the optogenetic excitations. So exactly what are being decoded here? Is that the reshuffled patterns from the V1 excited cells? Wait, hold on, too many things. So I'm gonna answer one by one and okay. you tell me you tell me if this answers your question. I'm gonna guess. Um so I think that for me the the decoding part is just to say this signals are in the visual cortex. And I think that for people that worked in visual cortex pre-2010, this was like super surprising, right? Like you don't expect that to happen. In our model, we don't like, that's something that you can do with data. Um, first that, then with respect to the reshuffling and decoding, so would your question be, if I can decode the input from the changes in activity or, I don't yeah. think I got it. Okay, I, I could uh, make it like a few key points. So first of all, in <laughs> Thanks, the original sorry. literature, they decoded all of the running speed and like from the excited reactivity, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we also know that all of these factory neurons, their activity won't change because of these outside excitations. Oh, they so, do change. Oh, they do change. They do change a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. okay. but the main activity. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they do change. That's, right. and I think that that's, that's the important part. Ah. Um, I think that one of the things that was interesting for us with the reshuffling is that you, if you go to the experimental world, um, some some people looking at you know changes in activity, they are like, oh, we do this manipulation and we observe this change in activity, and there is an implicit assumption of causality, like you know, like oh, we observe. We perturb this and there was no change, so it didn't have an impact. And it has an impact. And maybe there is an input. Uh, it's just that, you know, like the network dynamics do things that are so counterintuitive that you can't really like make that mapping one to one. Well, yeah. So just a quick follow up then. In that sense, um, all of the things that could be decoded would be some specific pattern that sort of like one pattern corresponds to one running speed, right? You, you would decode, yeah, you would decode something that incorporates all the neurons and decoding is just like putting a threshold in high dimensional space, but probably they are, you know, like, it's not only that. Okay, yeah, yeah. very interesting, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, yeah, thanks for your patience, everyone.